So without further ado, we're going to jump into our panel, and the way this is going to work, I have some uh, moderator questions for the first portion of the program um, that uh, were both written by the board and submitted by some members and neighbors, and then we'll open it towards the end for open questions. Um, but we're going to start with just a brief introduction uh, from each of our panelists. Tell us who you are, how you work intersects with housing, uh, starting right here at David. Hi, good evening everybody. Thanks for having us. My name is Jacob Bentlip. Are we on? Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Jacob Bentlip with the Oakland Tenants Union. Um, OTU's been around for over 30 years or so, going back to the time the rent program was started in Oakland. Um, it's an organization of housing rights activists and tenants that we do mostly kind of peer-to-peer -peer counseling and advice for tenants who are having issues with their housing situation. And we also work on policy advocacy uh, quite a bit as well. So that's what brings me here tonight. Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Dan Cobb. I think I know at least half the people here. I'm your, uh, your Oakland City Council member for all of North Oakland. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Eric, and thank you to LCA for sponsoring this. Um, since I've been on the council for just over six years, and uh, during that time, I've made a, made a priority to be working on housing affordability issues, both on uh, additional protections for renters and for trying to do more to get more funding to actually construct or help construct more below market housing uh, in our city. And so those have been priorities for me, they continue to be priorities, and we'll talk a lot in detail about that in the hour ahead. Um, but uh, happy to be here, and, and uh, thanks for having us. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I'm, uh, my name is Uche Owahemo, and uh, I'm the senior district field rep for Assemblywoman for a few weeks. You remember about a few weeks, right? Yeah. So, so I'm the senior district field rep. So, uh, just give you a brief. Uh, I think uh, when we came into office uh, uh, last year, Buffy uh, believed that housing was a critical issue uh, for her, and I think uh, we have 25 legislation that we pushed in this uh, current session, and uh, I'm excited to, to be working for her because she has taken this. Uh, issue very serious and uh, you can see that by a lot of the legislation that we are pushing is all related to housing and uh, so I'm excited to be part of this conversation as we move forward. Okay. Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Scott Simmons, a member and volunteer at a group called East Bay for Everyone. Um, uh, we're a group of uh, a volunteer run organization uh, and we advocate for policies and um, elected officials who we think are addressing the housing crisis. Um, I am uh, probably the least uh, policy-oriented person up here, so I will dodge all of the like hard, uh, uh, tough questions. Um, uh, as, a, as a volunteer with that organization, um, what I can kind of speak to here um, is the way, for me, I've been a volunteer for a little under a year. Um, and what's been really great for me is the way uh, that getting involved with the organization um, has allowed me to feel like I'm really making a difference in something that I think is um, really important and affecting this area in a really, obviously, difficult way. Um, so yeah, I'm hopefully here to bring that perspective from our organization. Thank you for having us. All right, so to leap into the questions, I'm going to start with uh, one that I think is going to be pretty easy, but also uh, important to address, and that is uh, a couple of years ago when it was clear that sort of this was a thing that was happening in the Bay Area, I was at a party and someone told me, well, I don't think it's a housing crisis per se, uh, and I was just a little bit floored by that. Um, so I'm wondering, what do you think you would say to someone who doesn't think this is an important issue or an issue that's worth addressing? Uh, well, it's definitely a crisis. I was working, at, I'm a professional city planner also, I was working at a consulting firm several years ago, and I remember when we were writing the report, and I was like, I was my boss, I was like, I'm going to use the term housing crisis, is that cool? She's like, yeah, I think it's there. I think the numbers show it. You look at evictions, you look at rents, you look at um, the number of households that are paying more than a third, more than half, or more than, even more than that, of their income and rent. Uh, it's a serious problem. I've had issues with my landlords, um, and I know I've certainly 
you know, been unable to uh, find the ideal housing in some situations, and then you find housing and the reality is there's folks that are at a level like me that are, you know, lucky enough to have a decent job, so for me the impact is that I spend half my income on my rent, so I'll not have savings to buy a house, um, you know, all, all those effects. There's that level, and then you have the level of folks who it's literally that or the street, or it's that or leave your community entirely. Um, and so, I mean, I feel lucky that I, my only problem is that I pay half my income in rent, um, and that's not even for a new unit. So, I mean, when that's, and you know, I feel like someone who was able to get a good education, I have a union job that actually, uh, you know, pays pretty well, so I feel very fortunate. And it still feels like, I ask myself sometimes, why am I, you know, can I really, is it sustainable for me to stay here and make my life here? So I would say that's a crisis. Uh, thanks for the question. So perhaps they are living in an alternate parallel universe yeah. or something, or, or they're a Romulan or something. Uh, so um, a recent poll, a very recent poll, uh, indicates that among Oakland City residents, not just registered voters, but residents, that uh, homelessness and housing affordability are the top issues. So this person is an outlier, and I would probably not spend too much time trying to convince them. I would just move on to another conversation. But clearly, it's a crisis. So, yeah. is it a crisis? Absolutely. Uh, and I think during the past election, we had this debate. Um, I said you about about few weeks made it very clear that we are in a housing crisis. And when you are in a housing crisis, we need to do everything possible to construct more housing. Whether it's affordable housing or market rate housing, we have to do all of the above. Um, and I agree with that. Anyone that thinks that is there who don't have a housing crisis must be living in a different, you know, different planet. Um, I, I spent 14 years as a social worker. I know. I know. Because I've done it on both sides. So I know. Uh, that we have folks there who cannot afford uh, to even spend a thousand dollars to, to, for a home, for an apartment. So do we have crisis? Absolutely. When you look at the number, um, I don't know what else you want to see. The number shows that we are not, we are not actually building enough housing, uh, market rate housing, to meet the need. Um, then when you look at on the affordable housing side, we are even worse in that area. We're not building even close to half of the need of people. So we're absolutely in a crisis and uh, we need to change our culture, our way of doing things in this country, in this state, in this county, if we are serious about uh, meeting the need of, of, our, of, of the people. Absolutely, we have a housing crisis. Um, yeah, like what everyone said, Eric, I think everyone wants to know what, what, where are you going to these parties? Like, who are you hanging out with? You're either partying really, really hard, or I don't know. Um, my response when people ask about, um, oftentimes when people from out of the area, right, are asking about like the rent in the Bay Area, um, or if I ran into somebody who was denying that it was a crisis, um, I, uh, I always find it most effective just to sort of share my personal story. Um, I'm, I'm super duper lucky. Um, I'm a straight white dude who went to college, who when the recession uh, knocked me out of a job, I got to go live with my parents for a while and save up uh, at a sales job and go back to school and then get a job and move out, right? So that stability that I was awarded because they had a home gave me an edge. If I didn't have that, I don't know where I would be. And the fact that I did go back to school and now that I do have a good job, Right, and I'm just making things. I'm, I'm, I'm just getting by. I live with my wife and my brother in an apartment, and we're we're basically not saving anything because we're pumping everything into rent. So, if I'm somebody who has like all of the cards are in my favor from the get go, and I'm just trying to get by, how is somebody who doesn't have all those advantages supposed to make any progress? Right, like we're in the Bay Area, we're in California, and we're very progressive, and yet. Um, we have a situation where the people who we're trying to fight for um, and advocate for uh, can't pay rent. And I think that's a problem. So, yeah. Let's talk more about rent. And let's talk specifically about uh, rent control. Uh, it's been a big topic recently. It was on the repeal of the Costa Hawkins. Uh, rent control restrictions were on the ballot statewide in the last election. Uh, that did not go through. Um, there's been changes at the local level in how rent control is approached. And I'm just wondering, um, what, is the, what, what, is the, what is the useful tool 
aspect of rent control? What does it actually let you do from a policy perspective? Um, and maybe what's it not as good at? And sort of what should be next at either the state level or the local level? Uh, what should people be considering? Uh, so, uh, 15 cities in California have some sort of uh, rent control protection. It's a very specific city, but 15 cities have it. And I think a little more than 15 have uh, what, would, what we call eviction protections or just cause for eviction protections. Um, there's consideration now at the state level uh, to enact some either Bay Area or statewide rules of some sort or another, primarily for the cities that don't have anything at all, because the cities that do have something will, will to have it. Um, we have to make sure that rent, the purpose of rent control is not to create more housing. That's not its purpose. And so people who criticize it say, but it doesn't, it doesn't create more housing. Well, yes, it also doesn't end the war in Afghanistan. But it, it doesn't do that. It's not, not, not meant to do that. Uh, it's meant to protect people who are already living in, in that given city. Uh, and I just shudder to think that if Oakland and other cities didn't have rent control over the past 10 years or more, um, what our city would, would look like. I mean, we already know our city has, has gentrified in many parts of the city and it's, we have a lot, of, a lot of challenges. Just to think what it would look like if we didn't have rent control, it would be so much worse in that regard. So uh, the purpose is to help protect people who, many people who actually live and work in Oakland to be able to stay in Oakland and not be pushed out uh, if, they don't have, if they don't make enough money. And so that's why rent control exists. We have it here. Um, Prior to maybe five, six years ago, Oakland's rent control was considered, um, let's say, middle of the road in terms of how strong and, and it, the protections were. Uh, starting in 2014 and, even, and, and then more so 2016, and, and I've been working on this a lot, and others have as well, we've strengthened it. We have, we have more to do, and I'm trying to do more when it comes to strengthening our rent control provisions. But within the confines of state law, you mentioned Costa Hawkins, there's lim limits of, as to what we can do. So we're doing most of what we can do. We're gonna do a little more, I think, and we'll see what else we can do in terms of strengthening eviction protection, strengthening rent control, adding more people to fall under rent control to the extent we can, and to continue to push for reforms to the state level. Uh, three years ago, long before we knew there was gonna be a Costa Hawkins repeal effort on the ballot last year, I went up to Sacramento and tried to get uh, legislators to reform cost the markets, not repeal it, just reform it, to allow individual condos to fall under rent control, to move the new construction exemption from permanent to only 15 or 20 years. Um, when I first went up there, and Libby went up there as well, uh, we could not get a legislator to want to offer, author that bill. It was, that's, that was the, the sense there from three years ago. A year later, they were falling over each other saying, I want to author the Costa Hawkins repeal bill. So that just shows you how the, the, the debate changed in Sacramento over just a year period. Unfortunately, it got to the ballot and the money was on one side much more than the other and it hit a loss. Uh, so there's more we can do. The, the goal of rent control and eviction protections is to reduce displacement, um, slow down gentrification. It's not going to stop all displacement. It's not going to stop all gentrification but it does protect some people who live in a city who probably work in that city and they need protections. And so we have a responsibility to keep our rent control uh, laws strong and to enforce them the best we can. Uh, I love rent control. The reason is because I just know too many good people who are only living here because their apartment is rent control. Teachers, um, educators, activists, artists, all kinds of people who have you know, good, what we would, you know, middle class jobs, who still, uh, they are able to be here because of the rent control. Um, also, it's, you know, if you think about it, look, it's like we all sort of bring our hands and say, ooh, how do, we, how do we manage growth and development that we need, and it's, and it's inevitable without displacing people, without destroying our communities. Well, you give people the ability to stay where they already are. Rent control is the most obvious, correct, and effective way to keep people where they are, coupled with just cause eviction protections, of course. Um, you've just got to have it if you're going to be in a place like the Bay Area, which is both blessed and cursed with our um, red-hot economy and our growth here. Uh, a few misconceptions about rent control, I think it's very often, you know, I remember back to, uh, you know, Economics 101, it's a classic example um, of, of a market distortion. But the reality is that rent control does not inhibit new development. Um, 
If someone's doing a new development and they are writing a pro forma and they're assuming they're gonna get 10% increases or more in rent every year, no one's gonna finance that. That's a ridiculous assumption. Um, it's totally reasonable to go in and finance a new development project, assuming you're only gonna get something around inflation in terms of the increase in rent every year. That's how people do development. So rent control is not gonna kill new development at all. People say, oh, well, you're gonna hurt the, the landowners, especially the smaller property owners. Um, Landlords are not bad people. Being a landlord does not make you a bad person. Being a tenant does not make you a saint. My parents were landlords at one point. They rented out their condo uh, that they had, and um, you know that's that's fine. I have friends who are landlords. They make it a point to try to work with their tenants and not kick people out and not, you know, I had I was talking to a friend the other night. She said, "Yeah, you know how I do it? I just accept a 17% return, not a 50% return." And she has a great life, and she would admit admit the same thing. So, um, and another thing that I think people don't think about with rent control, like we were talking about, you spend half your paycheck on rent, but what am I not spending that money on? I'm buying that a little bit less coffee from my local coffee shop. I'm not going out to dinner as much. I'm not shopping in Oakland as much. I'm just not spending as much money on our local economy as I would. It is better for the economy when more dollars are being spent in more places by more people, not giving all of the money to a small number of people who own property, and then in essence, also get the right to control who does and doesn't live in what neighborhoods in Oakland. I just moved, um, and it was so hard to go and look at some of these places and talk to the realtors with a straight face for the rents that they were asking for these apartments. I just wanted to say, what do you think you're doing? You know, what, honestly, who do you think is gonna pay for this? And they just act like, well, you know, I know it's a crazy market, right? So anyway, rate control, uh, I, I'm really encouraged in the last couple of years, like Council Member Call was mentioning, um, I think it's been, becoming a little bit more mainstream. It's kind of like, okay, we can talk about this now. Maybe this is a part of the solution. There are things that need to be done to make sure that you don't hurt the housing stock. You've got to be able to pass on it costs to improve the building. We don't want our, all of our buildings to fall apart. We've got to deal with seismic retrofits, things like that. So you need to be reasonable. But the idea that it's a third rail, that it's some kind of a, a, you know, a fantasy, you know, liberal fantasy or something is just nonsense. It's a very common sense approach to do exactly what we're all talking about, which is keep people in their communities. I think we all agree that we're in a housing crisis. And, uh, and for that, we have to do things to protect some of our most vulnerable people. And uh, uh, you, we, from what we've had already, uh, rent control is not doesn't create more housing, it's, a, it's part of the solution. And we have to approach it as part of the solution. Um, I told you earlier, I spent 14 years as a social worker. I fought for rent control for my client. Uh, but as, as we grow as a society, we have to ask ourselves, how do we create more housing? not just focus on one area uh, and, and say if we pass rent control, because I live in Richmond, we, we have rent control. So we're still struggling with supply. So the bottom line here is we have to understand that one rent control is part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. We have to start looking at some of these Jim Crow era housing policies that we have that prevents people from building. Yeah, we can't keep pretending that things are okay and then look the other way and say we, we want to focus on one thing. We have some of the worst housing policies here that nobody wants to address. I think Berkeley is doing something about it. I think they're having a, a March 26th or so, they're having in their city council, they want to start addressing this issue because they, they recognize that our housing policies really affect our supply. So we need to encourage that, whether it's in Oakland or Richmond or Berkeley, encourage uh, our uh, city council folks to change some of these Jim Crow laws that, that, that don't allow folks to build. If you want to build affordable housing in their neighborhood, they say we don't want it there. So where do you expect those affordable housing to go? In heaven? We have to build somewhere. So we have to be real. We are serious about dealing with the issues here. Uh, so these are part of what we are uh, we tend to avoid it because it's uncomfortable to have this conversation. I, I've heard uh, uh, Assemblywoman Buffy Witt during the campaign speak of this issue about this Jim Crow era policies that we are all avoiding. So uh, I really implore each one of us here to start looking into it and say, okay, how do we start building 
uh, everywhere that we kind of can. And then, uh, Senator Roman Buffaloics introduced uh, uh, AB 723. Uh, that's one of her uh, tax, ex tax exempt housing uh, bill that she, she introduced. So I will you know, probably share some of the, uh, some of those with, um, with um, Eric after this event, that way he can send you the email through email. But uh, she's introducing a lot of bills. We, in fact, we've introduced four bills that deals with housing. And she has co-authored three other bills. They're all about housing. Uh, the first thing we did, in fact, the second day into this office, if the, what we did was took a tour of the whole district encampments. Not just the encampment, we took a tour of the shelters. We did that, we also collaborated with the mental health service providers. We did first-hand approach and met with some of the homeless folks or folks that are living in this encampment so that we can see exactly what's going on and engage them in one-on-one -on -one conversation to find out how they arrive at where they are. It's very easy to sit in the office and have conversation about folks until you go out there and engage them and, and then you hear the stories about how they lost their home, their, you know, their, their job. And, and it keeps you to see that. It's not something that we took lightly. It was something that uh, um, we actually did some of the tour with the mayor of Berkeley and uh, some of the folks there expressed some of their feelings about the elected officials. How uh, are they doing enough? Are they really trying to solve this issue or are they dancing around it? So uh, I think um, I, I'm, I'm honored to work for Assembly Woman Week because she's actually on her friend. She's actually dealing with these issues. Uh, and and, and um, I think we will see some changes as we move forward. A lot of the legislation she's introduced here is meant to start addressing some of these underlying issues that we are afraid to talk about. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to share some of those uh, with you at the end of the event. Um, I didn't know if you wanted like four responses for each of these, so I'll be real quick. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, the one thing that I would add to everything that's been said, which is all awesome, um, I, I think something that kind of gets lost in the conversation around rent control um, has to do with community, right? Because for a lot of people, rent control is, is the thing that stops you from being priced out of your neighborhood. And for a lot of us, kind of being close to your neighbors, and whether it's family or friends or whoever, like that sense of community is, I think, very real and very valuable. I think it's something that can kind of get, um, I don't know, kind of glossed over in housing conversations. Um, and for a lot of people, um, you know, being priced out of their neighborhood is, is a devastating change. It means like moving school districts, it means potentially a longer commute or changing jobs. Um, it's, a big, it's a big life change, being like literally ripped out of your community. Um, and I think, I think it's worth, I, I just wanted to add that, I think it's worth keeping that kind of in, in in scope of what we're talking about um, when we're talking about housing issues. Well, we've started to hit at a couple of the other topics now, so I'd like to um, turn attention to what happens when displacement happens and some of our most vulnerable neighbors that get displaced um, are currently ending up on the streets at alarming numbers. Um, we've had the mayor come in and also um, Dan and other representatives from the city come in multiple times talking uh, to the group about lots of different efforts um, to either provide sanitation on the street, to provide uh, more transitional centers, um, to try and do something uh, different to help our houseless neighbors, uh, help people get on their feet, and I wonder if we could uh, kind of go into just an update about um, those efforts in the city and, and what's next. Ready to start? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, I mean, clearly we could have a, a, a meeting or several meetings just on the challenges we have with homelessness. So I'll try not to, to go to talk too much. Um, it's really kind of a three-part. You know, there's there's the prevention, uh, trying to prevent people who are at risk of becoming homeless for whatever combination of reasons from becoming homeless. Because the cheapest thing you could do is prevent the homelessness from happening in the first place. 
So that's one area. There is the short term, it may not be short term, but there's the more the crisis management, short term shelters, encampments, and what we have to do to help the encampments. There's that whole area of the more short term question. Uh, and then there's the interim and, and permanent housing. So if I were to say, okay, we need to spend more on uh, prevention, and we, we, got, we actually have a, got a, a big grant, uh, millions of dollars from, from private sources, foundations, and Kaiser, and so on. So we're, we're doing that. We've already we've spent some of our local money already, and we're going to do more of that. So spending more money on prevention and different forms of prevention, including grant protection, is one thing. And, and we'll do more, and we should do more. There is the, the crisis management and the encampments and the money it would take to, to make sure the encampments you know, stay clean and organized and, and there's some more shelters. That's, and, the, and the social services from the county, mostly from the county. Um, there's, more, there's absolutely more we have to do there and I think that is, I won't say manageable, but I'd say in terms of costs, there, there's money to do some of those things, probably not as much as we want, but we can certainly spend money. You know, displacement, uh, uh, prevention, short-term crisis management, and so on, and shelters and encampments. And then there's, then there's the, uh, long, the interim or long-term permanent housing. And that cost is way up to the top. And so you have the cost of these two over here, you know, and the cost of the third is like way up there through the roof and up to the sky. And that's what we, that's the biggest challenge. Because we could do, if we have, if we're successful, let's say, in bringing people into organized encampments and shelters and transitional uh, transitional centers and the, these navigation centers and and they work to some extent they work for a lot of individual homeless people but if we're more successful if you will in bringing more people into those operations so they can get some services and attention and assistance and, and handholding if you will to permanent or long-term interim or permanent housing we have to have that housing for them to go to and so the more people we bring into the system, if you will, to help to get to that, at some point we're going to run out of the housing. We kind of already have, but we're going to run out of places to put them. And so if we can't build more long-term interim or permanent housing uh, to, to the scale that we need, we're not going to be able to truly um, solve the problem. Uh, and that's the biggest challenge we have. And that's what we're trying to get more money to, to do from the state and all sorts of other sources, and that's what we're working on. We're working on trying to find more money, more funding to get to, to fund permanent housing, or what's called long-term interim and permanent housing uh, for our homeless residents. Uh, and they won't all go there, but you know, no one's saying that there's gonna be zero homeless people ever. But you know, we have way too many, uh, as, as we know, and we need to have more places for them to go. We, we have some, and we're building more. In fact, just over here, like most of you already know this already, but on the corner of West MacArthur and MLK, there are going to be two affordable housing projects uh, right across the street from each other. Uh, one is 43 units of extremely low income housing with those uh, individuals who are on the county's chronically homeless list getting first dibs um, for those units with, with wraparound services as part of that. That's at the southwest corner of Mac West MacArthur and MLK. Northwest corner, a couple of parcels put together, we're going to be a total of 75, 74, 75, 76 units of affordable housing, uh, very low, low, very low, extremely low. Uh, so some will be for, uh, could be for homeless, others for just very low income people. So that's all great, but that's a total of what, 110, 120 units? Maybe that'll be 160 people or so, 180 people there? That's great, but that, we have 3,000 or 4,000 homeless people. And so, we, you know, we, we're doing more. We have other projects that we're funding. We are putting as much money as we can into our affordable housing trust fund. We have to do more of that, but if that's our biggest challenge, is, get, is being able to build the housing, whether it's for our truly lowest of the low income people, our homeless people, or other below market levels. Um, that's our biggest challenge. Uh, and four years ago, um, there was nothing being built, almost nothing being built in the city, period. Uh, market rate or what have you. So we kind of had this big boom and a lot of housing is under construction now or being approved. You see all the cranes in the air, you see all the, all the apartments being built and most of that, not all, most of that is market rate housing. So whereas four years ago, five years ago, much many people in the city, myself included, felt we have to build more housing, period. Um, now we're at a point, okay, we're not done with that, but we've had some success there. So now I don't, 
now I'm not like all antsy and worried about building more housing. I'm focusing, and most of my colleagues are focusing on, you know, making sure we're getting more housing that's below market. And so we're putting an additional emphasis on that. We've already, we, we always have, but we're putting even more emphasis on that uh, in the coming months and years. And I'm hoping we, we could do more to build more housing and find funding from the state. We're not going to get any more money from the feds under this administration. So we're, we're lucky that not, they're not really cutting us that much, hardly. So, but, um, so the state has to give us more money. Fortunately, Governor Newsom seems to be on the, on the right page. We'll see when the budget comes out, in the final budget in June. Um, but uh, there, there, we have to build more housing. Um, I could talk about you know, the challenges with managing encampments and the, and the tough shed cabin things that we have with the mayor put together um, and the Henry Robertson Center, which is a really good navigation center. And we've, we've uh, increased that by 100 beds because we now have a second place called the Holland and we're going to have a third place. All, those, all the things we're doing help some individual people. Uh, um, and that's good. If you can help an individual homeless person, that's a great thing. You may not see that on the street. You may not know that we're helping 500 people this year as opposed to 300 last year, or, or, or what have you, because you, you still see 2,000 people on the street and you don't really notice a reduction because there's not. More people are becoming homeless. But we know we're helping more people than we were in the past, but the scale of what we need to do is so much greater that it, it's, it's, it's a big challenge. And we're trying to address that challenge. It's going to take more money to do that, and we're looking for that money. And as far as I can tell, Every person on the city council feels it's, it's the top priority issue. So, so we, we hear this quite often. We, we need to build more housing. Um, more people are becoming homeless. This is this is this is the, what I need each one of you here to do. I need you to visit one of these encampments. When you visit one of these encampments. You will go home and call whoever your council member is and say, we are not doing anything. Because nobody should be living in those encampments. If you visit those encampments, of all the encampments that we visited, there's only one in Berkeley here that actually is a model that you can say, okay, it's clean. It's something you can allow some, a friend of yours to live in. But it's, it's heartbreaking when I keep hearing folks say we need to build more housing. Why can't we build more housing? Is it rocket science to build housing? It's, it's really, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's disheartening when we keep saying we need to build more housing and then there, there are cranes all over the place and the people are still homeless and we're not even touching 1% of the supply. So I appreciate Dan saying that um, a few years ago that we couldn't, we were not building. You know, but, but when you are, you know, when people are in power, you expect them to address the need of the community. And housing is, is uh, it's actually, a, it's, not, it's not luxury. It's, it's something we all need. Um, somebody told me yesterday that we, as we are discussing these housing issues, we shouldn't forget about the middle class because um, often they are forgotten. So we focus on the market rates and, and in this our society, uh, folks who are making 100,000 cannot afford to even live in certain places. So this, who are we building this crane, big buildings for? Is it folks making 100,000 or is it folks making 500,000? So we need to start having serious conversation as to who are we building? And we talk about rent control as a solution sometimes. And then I look at the number of African Americans in Oakland and San Francisco. It disappeared. So I'm not really sure if, if we are paying attention to those numbers. Uh, so it begs the question, what are we, what, you know, what, what's the solution here? What are we doing? Are we really talking or we're saying, we need to build housing that people can afford and then make sure that if you are building in our community, you need to include those people who are making less than 100,000. Uh, so when we start doing that as a society, then we start addressing the issue. We can talk all we want about uh, we need to build, but we need to address the lack of actual construction to address the need of people. 
uh, it, it baffles me when we do this conversation and uh, we visited uh, encampments and we saw a 26 year old uh, engineering student that had one year to graduate from engineering school and, and his homeless is out there. I mean, it breaks your heart. So, and, and so these are real, real people, real life that we, we saw out there. And um, so that's when we finished that talk. Um, I think it was clear to me that assembly woman of a weeks. Her intent was, we're gonna do whatever possible to build more housing, and uh, and, and that's that's what we need to do. Then is to is to engage the state. Obviously, Newsom is interested in this. Assembly woman Weeks is interested in this. We have to be serious about the, the local. Jim Crow law, I keep bringing that up for a reason, because many of you are not aware those, those, those laws prevent you from constructing in certain areas here, and we can't ignore that, because it affects everything we're doing, whether you have the state funding, and then the, the, the constructor on Broadway, that's not for most of us here. So but we need serious housing, local, you know, laws that need to be changed and um, I ask you again to challenge your council members to begin to address those issues. If we do that, you will see the differences in terms of the supply and the construction. Um, I really believe that that will, that will have a, a huge effect on it. See the name of that one more time, just so I want to Google it and find it. Branches and Brooms. Branches and Brooms. That's awesome. Um, actually, what I wanted to say really quickly is sort of related to that. Um, the the uh, the community cabins, like the NAB centers, um, uh, depending on who you talk to, can be sort of controversial. Um, my experience with the, the community cabins, there's um, so sort of similar. There are the, like the lava made trucks um, that uh, offer. Um, it's a, it's a truck with three showers in it, three bathrooms, um, and it's offering sanitation for folks that are staying in the cabins. Um, and you can volunteer. You can volunteer to go help um, keep those running. Um, um, and I took that opportunity, and um, it's a great way to sort of meet these people and like find out what's going on, because I heard a lot of different voices saying what's going on in the community cabins. Is it a good way to solve this crisis or not? So I was like, I'm just going to go check it out. Um, um, so that's another thing you can do. Just it's great to have opportunities for things to do because I don't like I was saying before. Sometimes it can really feel like there's just nothing you can do, right? It feels like an intractable problem. Um, but there are there are little things we can do, like brunches and brooms, um, and you can look up lava may. Um, and what I wanted to say about that, kind of to the point about the community cabins, and this is not this is not like data, um, but my anecdote on that is um, a gentleman I met there who was staying in one of the community cabins. Um, was having a really hard time before he got in there, and then um, he was in the cabins, and then he moved into permanent housing, into an SRO, um, single resident occupancy. Um, and what he, what he was saying to me about it was that, the, the and this is just you know one man's story, it's not the whole picture, but um, it was inspiring to me, because he said that um, having, having that shelter, even though it was imperfect, um, it, it gave him time to sort of get his mental health together, um, which makes sense to me, you know, like live on a live on the sidewalk in a tent for four months and see how your mental health is doing. You know what I mean? Um, and so he, he he felt like that really gave him an opportunity to sort of get himself together to where he could go through the process of getting to something permanent. Um, and it was really inspiring. Like it was just cool to be like, okay, cool. Here's one person um, who that worked for. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, if you're looking for things to do, we're talking about sort of um, sort of what we can do, like just citizens, we're not, nobody in here, there are very few of us in here are elected officials. Um, um, 
you can go to meetings like this. Um, you can go to other meetings where communities are talking about, like, hey, uh, like over in, um, in Rockridge, um, uh, uh, the California um, Academy of the Arts um, is trying to build um, a new a a new, uh, new housing facility, basically. They're trying to build housing. And there's an affordable housing component to it. Um, and just showing up and saying, like, I think affordable housing is a great idea, um, has a huge impact. It really, really does. Just going to these meetings and say, saying to other neighbors in the community, like, I think affordable housing is a really good idea, we should do that. Um, I, 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 would, I was surprised how much of an impact uh, it has to just go there and raise your voice and say that I believe in this. Because some of the people there, you know, they don't see it that way. Um, so you don't want to be confrontational, but if you believe that, that this is a responsibility that we have, um, just raising your voice and saying that can be, can be really powerful. And that's something we do. It needs to be for everyone. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for asking the, the question. I, I would say, you know, the one of the most important things we can do for homelessness is also the most obvious. This is on the prevention side, and that would be universal just cause eviction protection. Uh, if you want to prevent people from being evicted from their homes, prevent them from being evicted from their homes. That's just cause. Same goes for rent control. You know. Uh, I saw a statistic, this is from San Francisco, but I'm sure it's similar here. Two-thirds of the chronically homeless people in San Francisco had a job a month before they became homeless. In other words, these are not, you know, deadbeats or whatever, you know, myth you want to say. These are people who lost their job and were living paycheck to paycheck. If I lost my job, I'd probably be able to afford my rent for like four months. And then I don't know, and then, you know, whatever, I'll move in with somebody or do something. Um, so sometimes the answers are staring us right in the face, and it's a question of political will. We, were, we mentioned the uh, enormous loss of um, our African-American community in Oakland. We talked about Costa Hawkins earlier, the state law that um, regulates rent control. One of the things it does is it exempts single-family homes from rent control protections. Well, where are there a lot of single-family homes being rented out to people in Oakland? They're concentrated in West Oakland and East Oakland, that, that particular housing type. So that's uh, a policy that disproportionately affects our black community because that's a big part of the housing stock for people in Oakland and they have zero protections from whatever rent increase you want to flip that house, go for it. So that's something the state could do, that's something that the city could tackle as well. Um, I also want to say this is obviously a regional and a state issue. Um, one major problem with homelessness, why is it so intense in San Francisco and the inner Bay Area? It's because this is a place where there's services and transit, and frankly, people with good hearts and governments that have tried to provide services, and we are being punished for the fact that other jurisdictions are not required to do their fair share, and that includes Beverly Hills and Atherton. And that can take the form of shelters in their housing elements, that can take the form of redistributing well, Oh no, what an idea. From those communities at a state level, you know, using the state tax system to redistribute funds to programs that are going to help deal with the issue if Beverly Hills doesn't want to deal with it directly, you know, for example. So it is a regional and state issue and it needs to be dealt with at that level. Um, Scott mentioned SROs, the uh, single resident occupancy, you know, these are residential hotels. You see a lot of that in the Tenderloin in San Francisco or here in Chinatown in Oakland. People don't talk about that housing stock a lot, but that's kind of your like last step housing option between housing and the street. I mean, these are, you know, they're, they're uh, hotel units, you got a shared bathroom, it's very cheap rent. Usually they're, they're pretty run down, but it's a, it's a roof over your head. I don't think Oakland does enough to protect our SRO housing stock. In San Francisco, it is almost impossible to get rid of an SRO by doing some other type of development project. They have to be replaced. The city has very strong rules that go back quite a long time, and I think it's something to be proud of. In Oakland, I've heard some really awful stories from people living in some of these SROs. You know, the Oakland Tenants Union people come to us, and half the time it's a therapy session. You know, we had a, a situation in Chinatown where, you know, the owner of the building was trying to sell it to kind of do this, like, tech dorm thing, because obviously they make a ton more money. So they were, like, ripping out the plumbing fixtures and electrical. I mean, they were creating unhabitable conditions for a building that was full of mostly senior Chinese non-speaking not English speaking, uh, individuals who were just scared out of their wits. And there wasn't much of a protection, there wasn't anything in the Oakland City policies to stop that building, uh, that project from proceeding. So we could do a lot to protect that particular housing stock. And we can also spend the money that we're going to get from Measure W, which we just passed, which is a vacant parcel tax to fund homeless services on a lot of the things that the council member called and others mentioned, especially navigation centers and the mental health and wraparound services. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that. Probably the easiest thing you can do to help the homeless crisis is to 
look people in the eye on the street who are homeless and just say good morning. I mean, honestly, that you mad sitting there, imagine sitting there all day long and hundreds of people going by and they all act like you don't exist, you start to wonder if you exist or not. You start to wonder if your life has any value. Um, and I've heard that from people who work directly with homeless folks um, in my job, and they say you can't underestimate how important it is just to say good morning and just recognize that they're there. That can really make their day. So that's something that doesn't cost us anything. Uh, there's been two, two big structural issues that have uh, been brought up a couple times already. Uh, and I want us to be able to talk about those a little bit, um, but I also want to get to um, Q&A. So I'm just going to launch both of these out there at once, and you can take either one or both as your prompt, because they, they're overlapping issues. Um, one is that uh, Oakland and every other city in the Bay Area is still adding jobs. I mean, like we said earlier, um, we're kind of a victim of our own success. Um, there's only a very small number of people, mostly on Twitter, who think the recession is a good uh, answer to the housing crisis that actually is going to cause a lot of pain and not the way to solve the problem. Um, but um, my question for that portion is, you know, are there structural incentives that are driving uh, cities to continue to add jobs much faster than they have housing? Uh, and then my second one is overlapping, but it's been brought up, uh, and that is Oakland. You know, there's no place, there's not a lot of empty lots in Oakland to plop down suburban development. So when we talk about adding housing in Oakland, we're talking about multifamily. Um, and in any city in the Bay Area, it is not something you can just do wherever you want. Um, there are, there's various levels of zoning, this and that. But one thing a lot of people don't consider is that even if you're talking about not just market rate, but BMR housing, below market rate, and even social housing or uh, city-owned affordable housing, any kind of project, you can't just override the zoning. Uh, you are working within that framework. Um, so um, to what degree is that, hold, is that a thing that's holding us back? I want to address the question of the structural issues that favor jobs over housing um, in California. So, you know, cities have different ways to uh, raise revenue, but basically what it boils down to is cities have to make some money off of the activity that's going on on their turf. We don't have an income tax. Uh, cities do not have, in California, really a good way to tap into the wealth in their communities. And when I say wealth, I don't mean um, things like payroll taxes, sales taxes, we have those things. Uh, I mean income tax. So why not have the state redistribute income tax revenue back to the cities in the same way that it does with sales tax so that we can actually tap into the wealth in the Oakland Hills to pay for the things that we need to pay for it. Uh, what happens is you get the development, you get the jobs, you get uh, all of that, and the city doesn't necessarily benefit from the wealth that's generated. The other uh, elephant in the room is um, what I always like to say is we have rent control for homeowners. It's called Prop 13. Uh, and we've had it for 40 years. And that limits the increase in property taxes and the assessed value of the property for people that own homes and keep them throughout California. That has been a huge incentive in the way the tax system works to favor commercial development, uh, big box retail development. It's called the fiscalization of land use. It's a well-known issue. And for decades, cities acted as if housing was a fiscal loser because all it meant was you weren't going to get that much property tax revenue, but you were going to have to spend more money on infrastructure and police and all that stuff. And so obviously it didn't, it was a loser financially and cities have to pay the bills just like anyone else. So there are major structural problems. Um, one is Prop 13. I would definitely look at the way that we tax wealth and redistribute that wealth throughout California. And in terms of zoning, yes, absolutely. We need, we need density in order to be able to build the part of the solution that involves building. We need to have the density. When you do the upzoning, when you do an area plan, think about adding things like rent control or inclusionary housing to go with that upzoning as a preventative measure to help balance the short-term effects of new development which are disruptive to the existing community even though it has to be a part of the solution. Uh, thanks for the, those two questions. Uh, one of the things that, uh, we have a regional problem, and we have, we have a problem in Oakland, you know, Oakland, Oakland, Berkeley, we have obviously a challenge right here locally for our housing uh, stock and serving the people who are working here and living here or trying to live here. Uh, but we also have a regional problem in the Bay Area and a lot of, a lot of jobs have been created uh, throughout the Bay Area over the past, since, the, since we came out of the recession. 
And those jobs, they're spread out somewhat, but they are sort of, sort of concentrated in certain areas, certainly the Silicon Valley, uh, the mid, mid Peninsula, San Francisco was probably the biggest concentrations, um, but they're, they're around in places too. The problem is that some of these big uh, employers who are have expanded, whether it's in San Francisco or down in Silicon Valley, um, they haven't been required to, in any substantial way, uh, build more housing or contribute enough money to build a substantial amount of housing for the, for the new workers they're bringing in. And that's a problem. And uh, you probably, some of you have probably heard about this, and I'm sure we'll get questions about this later, about this uh, regional uh, 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 plan or report or set of policies and mechanisms that a, 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 kind of a bunch of folks put together under the auspices of uh, the Association of Bay Area Governments and other, other groups. Uh, and there's some work happening in Sacramento to implement some of those. And there's some good things there, some things that maybe need some adjustments, but one of the things that they didn't do enough of and really kind of focus on in that effort, in that kind of regional effort, is, you know, take it to the big employers. Yeah, they mentioned that, but there really isn't any, I don't see any policy solution on the table uh, in local jurisdictions or regionally right now to really up the game in putting the, the, the onus more than it has been on those big employers to really do a, a bigger job in providing more housing uh, because they're the ones who are, you know, more housing is needed because people are coming to work here. Great, I'm glad we have a robust economy for most people, but they should be part of that effort and right now they, in most cases, are not part of that effort, in, in, a, in, a, in at least not enough. Um, the other part, um, we have to, you know, we have to build more housing and certainly more uh, low market housing for moderate, low, very low, and certainly the extremely low income as well. Um, you know, people are, are working in various places, living places. Uh, if we build more housing but we fail to build um, enough family size housing in Oakland or let's say Oakland Berkeley corridor, uh, then we're going to have, then we're not going to achieve um, some of the very crucial goals that we have as to why we want density in the urban core in the first place. And that, a large part of that is our greenhouse gas emissions, it's climate change. We need to reduce the amount of uh, hours, the amount of miles people are driving in their cars, whether it's by themselves or even with someone else, uh, vehicle, vehicle miles travel. We need to curb sprawl, so more, unless there are jobs out there, we need to curb sprawl so fewer people are traveling longer distances to get to their job. Uh, and the way to do that is not just to have density, but it's to have density of different sizes so, you, so families will want to stay here. Um, we are, we're building lots of apartments, which will eventually be condos in some cases, for single people or couples or maybe couples with, with one child, one, one young child. But when they have two children or three in some cases, uh, or even one who's older, they're going to move out because most of these units are not for those kind of families. And so if we don't require three, but three bedroom units, even occasionally a four bedroom unit, if we don't require those larger units in these multifamily, first of all, a lot of these buildings are not as attractive as they, as they should be, so they need to be less ugly. Uh, but but let's, let's say they are, all right? Let's say that they look good. We need to have larger units so families will want to stay here near to where they work. And so I want to, and I want the state, if they're going to require regional solutions, if they're going to put mandates in terms of uh, removing a little bit of local control or what have you, I want part of those mandates to be family size units in the urban core in order to keep families nearer to where they work. That is absolutely essential. If we don't do that, we will fail. We'll have density and we'll still fail. Anyway, you can tell I feel strong about that. <laughs> So that, that, that's a, actually a great question. So uh, America is built on innovation, right? That we all, that's what makes America great is our capacity to innovate. The Bay Area is the center of global innovation. That comes with price, you know, there's a price to be paid for that, and that price is housing. So I'll give you an example, Google has, uh, they, they build a billion dollar complex, and zero housing construction attached to that. So again, there's something structurally wrong with our whole system. And I keep going back to, uh, to the uh, local uh, zoning. I'm glad he mentioned uh, uh, that we need to have inclusionary
housing. In order for, you, for us to have inclusionary housing, we need to end the Jim Crow era exclusionary zoning. It's, it sounds simple, but it's a huge part of our problem. Um, so I agree we need to be inclusive in terms of the housing that we build, whether it's uh, moderate or to low income housing. We have to build all those things, but we have to be flexible in where we build those housing. But if we want to be inclusive, we need to eliminate the exclusionary zoning that we have here. And we start doing that through our local ordinances, right? The zoning policy here is, is terrible. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in 2019, there are we're still dealing with zoning policies that, that, not, that did not allow black folks to live in certain area, uh, people with mental health. That's what we're still dealing with, folks. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have to have inclusionary housing, but you can't have it when the law does not allow you to be in places that you need to be in. So, that's really the issue. Uh, and, you know, folks, uh, I think the median housing in, in our area here is about 800,000. So for you to actually do anything, you need to make at least 170,000 to actually afford anything. So, so I think yes, we are structurally deficient in many ways and we need to start dealing with some of the things that created all this in the first place. So, Could you give us a really super, like a brief lay language when you say exclusionary zoning needs to be eliminated, what is exclusionary zoning? So, give you an example. Let me, so, I, I take it to in Richmond. We have Point Richmond, right? It's a nice, beautiful area. Every time there's an opportunity for housing construction, the same folks that tell you we want housing, we want housing, they will be the first to protest and say, we don't want that housing in my neighborhood. We want it somewhere else. So, if you are if you're a developer and you want to build in those areas, you are, sometimes it drives you out of market. You, you say, okay, if I can't build here, I mean, I'm not trying to build a billion dollar home here. I'm trying to build a home that everybody can live. So, they, so those, and guess what? The city council will allow them to do that. So that's the, the law, the zoning is there. The, those exclusionary zoning allow them to actually say, yeah, it's okay, you can't. You don't have to build. So, and, and Dan can, you know, can attest to that. The city of Berkeley are actually doing something about it. I think it's on the 26th. They, they, the city council, is, they are trying to pass a law that will stop this. So, that means somebody's doing something about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, maybe Dan can introduce that in Oakland. That way, <laughs> that something can be done. Try not to use that word, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's hard to, like, not, not being super familiar with zoning law, what, what are the specific um, changes that would eliminate uh, the Jim Crow era um, type policies? I, I think some of the, I, I won't, won't speak for, for my friend and colleague here, but I think, um, some of those would be changing zoning in certain neighborhoods. Uh, one neighborhood would be uh, Rockbridge, for example, where I live. Um, and you know, we're, we're going to be starting actually to look at that, mostly along College Avenue, uh, to get some more density there, since there's a park station there. Um, but it may it may trickle into not the entire residential part of Rockbridge, but you know, a half block off of College, still within a half mile of the BART station could have more density as well as College Avenue itself. So, but it, unless you change the, the zoning laws, you can't do that. Uh, and so that's just one example. There, could, there are many, there are at least a handful, if not many examples in, in Oakland, Berkeley as well, all over the Bay Area, uh, where, where one could do that. There's a lot of effort at the state level to essentially require that in one way or another uh, to get around local um, reluctance to do that. And uh, Oakland, you know, those state laws that are looking to usurp, if you will, or, or modify local control, they're not doing it because of what Oakland's doing. I mean, Oakland is building housing and we have more to do and a lot, a lot of work to do in a lot of areas, but 
those laws that aren't ex don't exist because Oakland is a problem. They exist because there are a lot of these other cities around the Bay Area, Lafayette, and some of the cities in the Mid Peninsula, all around the Bay Area are, are in Marin County. There are a lot of cities in the, in the Bay Area that are a problem in terms of they're saying no to all sorts of housing. Um, not all the time, but much of the time. And so um, people complain about these efforts at the state level to, to, uh, to modify or reduce local control in some areas, in some, some, type, some manners. Um, but the fault of that are local decision makers in saying no too many times. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a rub, and there's a negotiation going on, and we'll see what comes out of that. But um, it's not a black and white, it's not a, a you know, yes or no issue, it's, it's, it's a complex issue. We're getting some. <laughs> I think these guys know that on that. So. Okay, so um, for follow up, uh, there is a purple sign up sheet, and if you're not already on the email list, um, or even if you are, please sign in. I'm going to ask all the panelists to send along any resources um, that might be useful, um, things that sounded like they needed, you know, people who are interested in uh, a little more depth on. This is a huge topic. Uh, you can, you know, there's people, this is their, their whole life. Um, so, you know, it's something you can really explore. Um, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A for a bit. So if you have a question, I'd like to get it on the microphone. So maybe if we could sort of line up starting at the end of this table, if you have a question, uh, we'd like to ask a question and we'll try to keep it to maybe a one to two panelist to answer just so we can get as many questions as we can. And, and if you have answers, we'll take those too. Yes. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so let's go right to that. Thank you. I wanted to ask... What's your name? Ida. Um, sorry, this is just... Thank you. See, there's a solution. I was thinking about the fact that surely you know, uh, people must qualify to be, let's say, in Section 8. You need to qualify. Not everybody can do it to certain people. But when it comes to rent control, are there any quantifiable things that, that, that I was thinking, you know, could, this must be very difficult to do, but who is more from Oakland than somebody else, or who deserves it more than somebody else for all of these, all of these very difficult reasons? I wonder if that's part of the conversation at all. That's kind of the existential question, the right to the city, who has the right to be where, and you know, the fact of the matter is the global population is growing, the national population is growing, people are moving here. So we will have to answer the question whether we like it or not. Um, the way I think about rent control in terms of who has the right to be here and who doesn't is, imagine a place where you have rent control on every unit so that you have certainty, you have the protection against um, fraudulent eviction. So you have the right to stay put in your home even while the, you know, million dollar condo tower, million dollar unit condo tower is going up next door, and you're not at risk of being kicked out because of the, the market forces. Um, if we were in that environment, then the people who are here now have a price cap on what they're paying to live. The people who want to move in would be the ones who have to ask themselves, well, hmm, how much is it worth it to me to live in Oakland? Am I willing to pay $4,000 a month for an apartment? And limit that conversation to the new units that are being provided in addition to what's already here. And then you have the folks who are already here, shouldn't be having to, who already decided to live here. It doesn't matter how long, five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. You shouldn't be having to ask yourself, oh, do I now want to double my rent to, or whatever? To, do, do I want to pay $4,000 a month to be able to stay here? So rent control kind of changes the question, I think, and it isolates the, the, um, that whole dynamic of who wants to pay that premium to the folks who want to join the party. And I say everyone is welcome. I mean, I've only lived in Oakland for 10 years. People love to get into the, that, that whole match about, well, how long have you been here? Oh, really? Okay. So it's like, is my opinion one-tenth, you know, how does, how does that work? You know, and then ultimately that conversation ends in build a wall. So we don't want to go there. You have to let people in. You've got to make room for everybody. But also, do the common sense thing. The people that are here, here. Of course. Having, of course, the side effect of the rich people that buy now get in early. Yeah. yeah. So let me, let me add to that. Um, so I, I agree with what, what I just heard. Um, Sometimes people will kind of extend or modify, I'm not saying you're saying this, but some people will bring this up as to how come upper class people or, or fairly well off people get to live in a, a rent controlled unit if they happen to have been here for a while and they're already here and so on. 
And let, let, me, uh, let me answer that because people ask that in my office a lot. Um, if we had rent control where only, let's say, middle income and lower income people got to have rent control and everybody else who were upper middle and upper did not, we would have a situation where because all rental, virtually all rental units eventually become vacant. It may be after three years, maybe after 20 years, but eventually all units, rental units become vacant because people eventually move on and they get to go to market rate at that point. If you had a uh, means testing, if you will, income testing for rent control, that means when a unit becomes vacant, as they will all become at some point in time, uh, the, the landlord, the property owner, will have applications and they will look at the applications and say, oh, here's somebody, a middle class person with a really good credit history and I like this person, and they'd be under rent control after they move in going forward. Here's an upper middle class person who would never be under rent control because they make a lot more money. Who are they going to pick? Every single time they'll pick this person and eventually rent control will effectively disappear. And so that's why we can't have a means testing in rent control. We have to have it for everybody in the units that are eligible for it so we don't eventually lose rent control altogether. And so that's, I hope people understand that. It's really important that we don't means test rent control. That's, that's, a, that's, that's the end of rent control over time. If I can pick you back on that real quick. I'm getting, I feel like a little bit, and I feel this way too, that um, it's a little bit unjust, a lot of the things that happen around housing, right? Um, um, my, my like short philosophy on that is that like housing should be a human right. Housing should not be like an amazing investment. Right? Housing can either be affordable or it can be a really really good investment. And right now it's a really really good investment. Um, so yeah, and, and also that what you said applies to people who, who get into a rent control unit a long time ago. It also applies to people who bought their homes a long, long time ago and are now you know house rich, cash poor. You hear that a lot, right? Um, but if we want housing to be something that's available for not just the very wealthy, that's rentals and, and uh, purchase homes, um, we need to make more of it. Like, the, the, the building, building more housing all by itself isn't the solution, but there is no viable solution without building more housing. You know what I mean? Thanks. That was a great answer from all of you. Great question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I showed up late, so I apologize if you all addressed this before I came. Um, but I'm wondering what you all are doing to stop the in the sweeps of the encampments. Um, and you just a month ago at Lake Merritt, it was pouring rain, and there were two days of sweeps, and all of people's possessions got thrown away, and that's unacceptable. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Nico Skin and at the 12th Street parcel. Um, we show up. Um, you, 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 um, at least in East for everyone, something that we really try to do for everything is like go there, meet people, look them in the eye, understand what's happening. Um, and it's it's a it's a tough issue, right? Like especially especially for Nico's camp, like um, he does they they do not want to be moved to the community cabins. They're like staunchly, nope, we're right here. This is where we are. And they're on and they're it's weird because they're on a public parcel that there's a whole bunch of weird like I'm, I'm sure somebody else could talk to it more uh, accurately than I could. But there's there, somebody was trying to make um, affordable housing there, but you can't because there's an encampment there. So it's a really sticky issue. And and I, I don't and I I just wanted to pipe up first because. It's, it, it's a really sticky issue, and I don't think there's like an exact answer, but I think the first thing you do is you show up. You go there, and you meet people, and you say, like, what's going on? What's going on from, from your perspective, right? From the, from the people in the encampment. Um, and what's going on from the people who are there trying to, trying to put them someplace like, like the community cabinets? Like, figure out what's going on from, from both perspectives. That makes sense? Um, because it's really hard, from just like hanging out on next door and Twitter, like trying to figure out what, you know, what the right answer is. Makes sense. So I'll try to add to that. Yes. I'll try to add to that. Um, the, the generally, and I, this is the, the, the city administration, city administrator, and the, the executive branch of our government makes these decisions, but sometimes council members can have suggestions or input, whether they take it or not, who knows. But um, uh, generally what I've sensed is, and I'm not, uh, I can't say I know everything about what goes on in the entire city, uh, you know, for better or worse, um, we, while we have homeless encampments in North Oakland in District 1, um, we, there are, compared to other parts of town, we don't have that many. We have some, and, and it's challenging, and, and no matter where they are, they're, they're challenging to be helped the best they can. But there are many more encampments in most other parts of town. Um, and the times where they get the most complaints, or, or, they, see, or, or they see their own people, the city workers just see the, the problems, is when the, the encampments in one place or another, uh, get quote, quote unquote out of hand, meaning it's not just 
what, 10 or 20 or, or X number of tents, but it's like trash kind of spewing out from the tents and it's kind of all over the place and it's dirty, messy, it's on both sides of the street instead of one side of the street. It, it seems to have gotten out of hand and that's very subjective. And so, um, for example, at 42nd Street, um, there have been times where that has seemed to have gotten out of hand and more recently, it seems to be contained. Um, I, I had asked some people who live there and city workers who go, go there to clean things up without, without, getting, without uh, destroying the camp, but just cleaning it up, to say, let's, let's try to keep it on one side of the street. I get a lot of complaints that people can't walk. You know, people have the right to walk. You know, kids go. So, um, okay, let's keep it on one side of the street. Let's keep it under the underpass and not spreading out to, to where homes are closer to homes. Let's pick up trash more regularly. Let's try to get at least some of the, the residents who are in those tents who are you know, who you can work with um, to be more responsible about picking up their trash. Let's get some carts there. We all have trash carts and recycling carts in our homes, right? Well, why can't they have them? I think they should all have them. Uh, and so if if we could all reduce the number of resident complaints of neighbors who live very close by. We could reduce those complaints dramatically if we can help them, as we've heard an example already, help keep those encampments manageable and not, and not look like they're ridiculously dirty and out of hand. So that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I, I know that when you take a look at an encampment and you break it up, where do they go? In most cases, they just go three blocks away or they come back three weeks later to the same place and you really haven't solved anything other than reducing complaints in that immediate neighborhood, but then you move those complaints later somewhere else. What have you done? Nothing. Uh, and so the, the goal is to move at least some of those residents when you are totally shutting down an encampment to some alternative location. Some go there and like that, others don't. Um, and we're running out of those locations so we can't do that very much. Um, so there, there's no great answer. Um, I think in the interim, as we're trying to get a handle on the problem and build more long-term inter in, long interim and permanent housing, uh, is let's do our best to help keep those encampments manageable and, I hate to say attractive, but less ridiculous looking, less dirty, less messy. You know, that will, that will help. That, that'll reduce, the, ne the neater and more organized they look, the fewer times they'll be broken up and, and pushed aside. Yeah, yeah, just just one quick that the encampments that we visited, uh, obviously there were a few of them that, for health reasons, that they could easily be closed. It's, uh, there's one on 35th and Peralta, uh, by the overpass, and uh, the condition there is, 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 is terrible. If you go in there, you will actually come out feeling, feeling bad, you know? Uh, but so, uh, health reasons are usually one of the number one uh, it, the reason you, they close those encampments. And then the neighbors complain is you know, usually part of the reasons. But, but I mean, for two, over 20 years, I've been involved in some form of um, advocacy for homeless and homelessness. And, Housing. I have never met anyone that prefers to be homeless. I've never met anyone that prefers to be to live in, a, in an encampment. You know, so it's, it's it, when you when we're able to provide you know, wrap around programs for folks and actually help them uh, in ways that they need to be helped, rather than provide them housing and then disappear, then we can start dealing with the issue of homelessness. Not, I mean, none of those folks we spoke to there really want to be homeless or be an incumbent. The young man that I spoke about, 26 year old, we were able to work with Operation Dignity and, uh, and we were able to have him in, in, in a tough shape. Um, uh, so um, so that's, that's really the way, that's, that's one of the reasons they closed them. So. I want to give one more shout out to the Brunch and Brooms program because that actually is a, it's a small scale, uh, but it's addressing exactly what's being talked about here, which is it actually started because there was a number of, this is actually in the underpasses, it's usually Caltrans, that's clean outs. Uh, and there was a number of complaints and there was a number of clean outs that they came in and didn't care and they just pushed everybody out of the way, took all their stuff, put it in dumpsters. 
And then Brunch and Brooms actually started as a way to both coordinate with the people that were living there and with Caltrans so that it got to the point where, or it was either Caltrans or the city would come in and bring a truck so that uh, people could work together to clean up and then not get swept right up. Um, that, you know, it's a very small scale because we're talking about one, one or two underpasses, uh, but that is something that if more people got involved, could grow into something bigger, potentially. And I would just like to add that the, one of the points that was that the people who were living under the underpass also helped to deal with the illegal dumping that happens there, which is a whole different topic, but the illegal dumping that happens there actually is mitigated by people collecting it and moving it into a space where hopefully the city will pick it up. And we've gone on and off with the city being willing to come in and not come in to do pickups, but it actually keeps the streets clear because that is a very common illegal dumping spot. So yeah. we try to help with that as well. I wanted to add to that that what you made me think of, this is weird. <laughs> um, the brooms and Brunches and rooms. The other solution that I just thought of that would be kind of interesting is if people just took their recycling and garbage bins and stuff on the day before. Because I know I, mine's never full, like filled with the bins. I'll come, I'm coming to your house to put my stuff. <laughs> you can come to my house and put a bag in there and be fine. But I imagine like if you if you had 15 people that did that like every week, that would help clean those up pretty pretty quickly. So it could be like a what would you call it, like a bin brigade or something? Anyway, so that's one solution. Brooms and bins. Brooms and bins. <laughs> anyway, um, has there any, ever been discussion in Oakland about a vacancy tax to um, uh, create some revenue and also disincentivize uh, landlords from raising? I mean, even if you threatened it, even if it didn't actually ever happen, it would disincentivize landlords from raising rents just a little bit. Yeah, we actually passed measure. <coughs> sorry, we passed measure W last year uh, that creates a, a vacant property tax in Oakland uh, under in certain situations. It hasn't been implemented yet because there's a lot of regulations and, and definitions to create. Uh, but basically, if um, if a building you know, has has a lot of vacancies, or if this is commercial buildings too, a vacant lot. Um, a uh, all the retail in one building on the ground floor, or there's a whole sorts of combination of things, and so I think it was written in a way where the drafters were so concerned about um, not getting too much opposition that they they created a lot of effectively exemptions, or it made, they made it hard. So I, I think you're not going to see not a whole lot of money raised from it. Um, so there'll be some. Um, and in some cases, some people will be assessed money who probably shouldn't be. In other cases, people should be and probably won't. It's an imperfect law. We may change it, you know, a couple years from now. We'll see. But um, we have at least the, the groundwork to do that. It may take a few years for it to get actual, actually, you know, solid in place. I can't recall if I ever understood. Is are the funds earmarked for anything specifically? For the Measure W, the yes. Basic, yes. Although it's several different things, but. Um, Homeless services, affordable housing, illegal dumping are all part of are all part of that list of things that are eligible. And those would be the, one, the money that, that that's what we would likely spend it on once we start getting money from that tax. And again, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. And one last one because we we've kind of peripherally touched on um, how prevalent mental health. Um, issues are in the unhoused population. Um, I understood that maybe 20 years ago or so, there was a, a, a number of mental health facilities that were closed, and people who really needed this help and support were put on the street, and that's part of the, the current problem. Um, is there any will and um, momentum behind building or implementing mental health services more and facilities for this? Um, I'm not aware of any specific efforts, but I would just say um, that that you need the wraparound services when you're dealing with homeless that involves the mental health services as well as everything else. And that, in addition to building the housing, is going to require a massive amount of money. And that money should be coming to the state. 
So I think this is a question where we, you know, we need to do all the things we're doing locally, but at the end of the day, this is going to be a regional and a state issue, and we just need to fund proactive services to deal with this population that has a very specific set of needs. We're not going to wish it away. We're not going to zone it away. Um, we need to spend real money, and that money can come from Calvary, the like, sixth largest economy in the world. We can figure it out. Uh, I agree with that. I would add that uh, public health services, mental health, that's uh, traditionally and appropriately the responsibility of the county, in this case Alameda County, uh, and they, they have some of those. They, they could do a lot more. Um, there is some state funding, Prop 2, which you all voted for, it passed, finally freed up some, some money. It, it's a billion, couple billion, but it's not you know, the whole state. Uh, some money that will earmark existing mental health funds for, for people who are homeless, um, and that's, that's a good thing, and that hasn't really been spent yet, or is just starting to come to the counties, so that they hopefully will do more with that money. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot to do. I don't know, I can't say I know everything that the county is planning on doing in the next, next fiscal year. Um, our city human services department, our homeless task force folks, talk with the county on a regular basis. They're doing some things, we feel they can do more. Uh, and we're hoping to get to do that. Um, I'll, I'll also say that, uh, that I forgot what I was going to say. Um, well, I forgot. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a lot to do when it comes to uh, mental health, and uh, I, it's, yeah, it's, it's challenging. Oh, I, I know what I was going to say. Um, I don't know, we don't know exactly how, what percentage of our homeless population are mentally ill, but you know, a lot of people who have mental health challenges, in some cases serious challenges, are not homeless. So I, I think it's important not to make any presumptions, uh, not you, but your neighbors, your friends, your family members, whoever it may be, not to presume that most homeless people are mentally ill or, or, they're, or they're homeless because they're mentally ill. It may or may not be the case, um, but th there's more to homelessness than just mental health, health challenges, even though that's uh, important for some people. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and that I don't think um, uh, we know for a fact that there are money in a lot of these counties, Contra Costa County, Alameda County, that the county and not use that are earmarked for homeless uh, mental health. We know that for a fact, and that's one of the uh, conversations we are having. Uh, Somebody who my weeks, where uh, she actually will be reaching out to the county to find out why some of these millions of dollars that are sitting there that have been earmarked for mental health are not being used. So um, sometimes we talk about funding, sometimes money, yeah, there's money there, but the question I always want to know is why are they not being used? So, and then we have a lot of uh, organizations here, non-profit, that are actually doing a great job um, providing these services. So, uh, and then we're not funding them. Um, I met with a group today that deal with re-entry folks, uh, people who are considered lifer. The, uh, there was a young a guy that was, that was sent to prison uh, when he was 15. He spent 23 years there. So these organizations are actually working with them to reintegrate them into our society. But the issue they complain about is there's no funding. But when you look into it, you find that there are money sitting there. Uh, question is why are some of these counties not using the money? So uh, my uh, Assemblywoman Weeks has made that an issue that she's, she's going to be meeting with uh, the county leaders to find out why this money are not being used. So hopefully we'll find out something and then um, can actually let you know. Um, the other thing I would kind of tack on to that is again, um, it's an opportunity show up like because um, when the money happens for these things and when there's an opportunity for this kind of transitional center to be built in the city um, I'm sure it's someone in here but like people will show up and say no 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 I would I don't want that in my neighborhood um, think of the kind of people that would bring here and that kind of thing um, I, it's a complicated issue right um, but you know for people who think that that's an important thing and that's an important responsibility for us to help these folks transition back into being housed to be you know, part of society again, like those transitional centers are going to be important. And having people show up at the city council meetings and the planning commission hearings and that kind of thing and saying like, hey, I'm a resident, I'm a voter, um, and I really want this here. I think this is an important thing that we can do 
as Oakland to make this happen. Um, so again, just just showing up, like it can be hard sometimes. You gotta like find a, an hour in an afternoon to go like to one of these meetings, but if you can swing it, um, it, 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 it moves the needle, it really helps. All right, well that's going to conclude our program. I want to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, I hope you learned something tonight. I know I did. Um, and I thought I knew a lot about this coming in, but there's always new things to learn. Uh, if you want to keep the conversation going at all, um, some of us will always meet up after these meetings at MLK Cafe. It's on MLK and like 38th or 39th. It's easy to find. It says MLK really big. Please sign in to the purple sheet. Uh, we'll send out contact information for all of the panelists and some follow-up resources. Uh, and um, I think that's it. So let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much.